Well, thank you. It's nine o'clock. So I will call the uh, neighbors of Dunn County Standing Committee meeting to order. And first off, uh, Dr. Steve Brown is uh, sitting up here. So if you're watching out there, you're wondering who that is. Uh, he, he formerly was the uh, medical director. Uh, and uh, so. And uh, we welcome any uh, people to come in person and, and see our meetings. So first off, uh, call the roll. We have Miss Supervisor Lenau remote. We have uh, Carly Witzel and Barbara Lyon and myself. Uh, Supervisor Bren Breslin uh, is not able to be here today. So we have a quorum. Was there any public comment? No public comment. And then we're down to five, and uh, you told us we're going to get a good dose of, of you today, huh? Okay. Yep. Oh, yeah. Thank you very much. The minutes from last month I skipped over. Uh, any changes? Uh, okay, then I'll take a motion to approve the minutes. So moved. Okay. Supervisor Witzel, Supervisor Lino uh, moved and approved and seconded. <coughs> All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Uh, it was approved. Now we can go on to number five. And this is something that I asked uh, Carmen to do when we had uh, a couple of new supervisors. That would be Supervisor Lino and uh, Barb. Uh, although you had a lot of experience, I thought it'd kind of be nice to run over it again. Okay. So thank sure. you. All right. Um, so as Chairman Kinnear said, this is just an overview of the neighbors and nursing homes in general. If there's any questions or things that you want more information about, please ask. Um, it's a lot of information. Um, so I'm going to try to not get too deep into the weeds, but just some information about what we do, um, some of our regulatory bodies, payer sources, things like that. Um, so NDC is three separately licensed skilled nursing facilities. Um, so we are all skilled nursing. We do not have any uh, assisted living or CBRF or independent living. Uh, they are all licensed independently. So what that means is when we moved from this building, um, which was the Dunn County Healthcare Center, we were under one licensure and we moved to the neighbors in 2013, so a little over 10 years ago, and we split into three separately licensed facilities. The main reason for that is the state does give an incentive for being under 50 beds. Um, there's some statistical things about nursing homes that are smaller, um, having better outcomes, so they do give an incentive for being under 50 beds. That's why we are three separate. Um, so what that does mean is everything we do is in threes. Um, you'll notice that on some of the financial stuff is that every building is financially set up separately. Uh, so people like me or anybody else that there are only one of, we're split between the three. Um, and then some positions and things like that are independent for each of the three nursing homes. That also means that the state views us as three separately licensed facilities. So our rates are different in each building. Uh, we have different surveys for each building. Our ratings are different for each building. Um, everything like that is all separate. So um, in the eyes of the state, it's no different from going from east to west as it would be from going from one of our facilities over across town to ALH. So they see us as completely separate. Um, so we operate that way, but we also see ourselves kind of as one whole nursing home. Um, so you'll also see in the financial packets that we do comprise it all as one um, because there are some things that we purchase or do that really do affect the whole. Um, so it's kind of confusing, uh, but uh, it's all separate, but then we all operate together. Uh, on total, we have 137 licensed beds at the neighbors. So each building is roughly 45 beds. Uh, currently, uh, eight of our nine households are open. So there's three households in each of the neighborhoods. In the central neighborhood, there's two short-term rehab households and one traditional long-term care household. In the east and west neighborhoods, there are each two traditional long-term care households and one memory care household. So a total of nine. Uh, the closed household is in the central neighborhood. That is Arrowhead Lodge. 
uh, that is primarily one of our short-term rehab households. Um, so only Fireside is currently opened as short-term. That being said, we can admit short-term individuals to any um, house on campus. Uh, we are duly licensed for both Medicare and Medicaid across the whole campus. Uh, so anyone can be admitted to any household. Um, we try to admit people to where we think they're going to stay uh, because moving people is traumatic and causes more issues and things like that. Um, so if we know someone is going to stay long term, we typically try to admit them to the household they're going to live in long term versus admitting them to central and then moving them later. That being said, if they don't think they're going to stay um, and they come short term but then decide to stay, we still um, would have them move to a different household um, that would be more suited for long term care. So across the campus right now, we're averaging around 110 for census. That has dipped a little bit in the last couple of weeks due to having some COVID outbreaks. Um, so that has required us to not admit to certain households. Uh, so we've had a few different um, people discharge, especially around the holidays. People want to go home um, right before Christmas. So a couple in the last couple of weeks, we've had a lot of discharges and not as many admissions. Um, that'll pick back up again, especially after the holidays is normally our busiest time because people see their family members and realize that they may be needing more assistance than they thought they needed. Um, and then we do see an influx in admissions right after major holidays like Christmas. Um, switching gears a little bit, um, I did talk about the difference between long-term care and post-acute care or short-term um, in our campus, but there's also a difference for payer source for those. Um, so I'll go down kind of a breakdown of the different payer sources that we accept. So our number one payer source is Medicaid. That is state-funded care. So that is people who are not unable to pay for their care themselves and are on the Medicaid system. That makes up over 70% of our residents. Um, and I anticipate that number is not going to go down. Uh, we are seeing more and more people on Medicaid as care goes up in cost, as well as people um, have not saved as well as past generations have. Uh, so there's less people that have the kind of money that is required to pay privately. So we are seeing more and more Medicaid. Uh, so I anticipate that to stay around the current level, if not increase um, to a higher percentage. That being said, Medicaid has had some significant increases over the past couple of years. So Medicaid is not the scary payer source it used to be. Uh, we used to talk about Medicaid and trying to lower our Medicaid numbers and raise our private pay numbers. And now that is not the case. Uh, we actually have higher Medicaid numbers than our private pay. So we get paid more for a Medicaid resident than we do for someone that's here under private pay currently. So. Um, that being said, it's not necessarily a bad thing that our Medicaid census is continuing to rise. Other payer sources, I did mention private pay, that would be people who pay privately to live at the nursing home. Um, that is a very small percentage of our population, but there is some. Um, we also accept Medicare, that is for short-term rehab individuals or someone who is long-term, goes to the hospital and comes back to us on a Medicare stay. And then those last throughout the length of their therapy, or if they have other covered Medicare services, um, such as um, difficult wound care and things like that would also be potential for Medicare services. Um, Medicare is typically a very high payer source. Um, it is based on the resident's needs directly. So for Medicaid, we get a set rate for each building for a period of time. Medicare is based on the person's MDS scores, which is the minimum data set, or is our generally how we determine what we are needing to provide for each resident. It is completed um, by our interdisciplinary team, um, mainly comprised of our MDS nurses, and then also includes therapy, uh, dietary activities, and social services. So that generates a score, and then each resident on Medicaid, that score correlates with a level of payment. But typically, they are higher payer sources. In addition to this, we also have um, Medicaid or Medicare-like insurance plans. 
So that would be Advantage Care plans. So if you hear Humana, um, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, um, all of those different um, purchased plans that operate like Medicare, we also have a very small population that use those um, services and then we get paid through them. We do have to be in network with those um, providers. Uh, so we have a contract or a agreement with an organization called Leading Choice Network, um, which is an offshoot of Leading Age, which is our member association, and that they help us negotiate contracts with insurance companies like Humana and Blue Cross and all of those other um, insurance, United Healthcare, stuff like that. So we do sometimes have some of those. It is a very popular thing on the Eastern side of the state to have Medicare Advantage plans. We see very, very few. The majority of our short-term people are on straight Medicare. And then our final payer source that kind of ebbs and flows is we are the VA contract for the county. So every county has a VA contracted nursing home. Uh, they limit them to one per county. Um, all three of ours are contracted with the VA. They see us as one, um, so it's not like we have one of the three that is um, VA contracted, but we do have people that live with us under VA contracts. That being said, not every veteran qualifies for a VA contract. It depends on their service. If their service um, had um, a direct correlation with why they're with us, um, and then sometimes hospice care is different as well. So um, at any given time, we typically have a handful of VA contracted individuals. So that's kind of our payer source breakdown and switch gears again a little bit. Um, so we are regulated by both the state and federal governments. Um, so CMS is a term you'll hear me say a lot. That's the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Um, so that is our main regulatory body. It is a federal entity that generates the majority of our regulations as well as any changes, memos. Um, COVID was a really big time for things changing every day. We got most of that from CMS um, as well as they generate the payment breakdowns and things like that too. Um, and then, so there are federal regulations through them. And then the state of Wisconsin is um, the DQA, which is a Department of Quality Assurance. They help enforce CMS's regulations. And then also there are state regulations that are added on on top of the federal regulations. So an example of something that has both a federal and a state regulation is um, abuse reporting. So um, every state has a different abuse reporting regulation. So the federal requirement is the minimum and then states can add on to it. So you basically have to follow whichever regulation is stricter, either the state or the federal regulation. Um, so for an example, Wisconsin does, you have two hours to report an instance of abuse um, and then five days to do a follow-up of that um, and five business days. Illinois is 72 hours instead of five days. So that state decided to have a stricter regulation on that um, and Wisconsin follows the federal regulations. So it's different in every state. Um, and there's just some nuances and one-offs for all of those regulations. There are lots of regulations. Um, nursing homes are the number one regulated industry in the world. Uh, we have lots and lots of regulations. A lot of them are very common sense. Um, if you're doing things how you should be doing them. Um, you're most likely following a lot of them. Um, and a lot of them are things that are kind of nuances. So there's a very specific way we have to wash our hands. Um, there is a very specific way that we have to report things or do different things. So um, a lot of that is standards um, that are nursing standards or CNA standards, but then you add it all together and it ends up being more regulations than any other entity. The reason for that is we do um, provide services for the most vulnerable population in the world. Um, so we have people that are unable to care for themselves as well as unable to advocate for themselves. And they don't typically have families that are there every single day. 
Um, so obviously children are also very um, vulnerable, but they typically have a lot of advocates around them. Our people don't always. So um, the regulations are there to make sure that we're doing everything that we are supposed to be doing. Um, and unfortunately, there are places that don't. Um, so they're there for good reason. Uh, they can sometimes seem a little bit tedious or um, very minor that end up being a bigger issue, but they are there for good reason. So um, we talk about regulations a lot at committee meetings, especially after surveys. Um, so there's there'll be a lot of discussion about that. The next thing I had on my list was surveys. Um, so we are surveyed by the state of Wisconsin and or the federal government on an annual basis. Each of our three neighborhoods receives a separate annual survey. Uh, so they are all on separate windows. Uh, so when we say annual, it, they can show up anywhere between nine and 15 months after the last time they were in that facility. Um, they show up unannounced. So we call it being in your survey window. Um, is from that nine to 15 months. It's typically right around a year, if not a little bit longer than a year. Um, surveyors are also short staffed like everywhere else. Um, so we are seeing them being extended longer out. We do have a very good history of surveys as well. So buildings that have history, history of troublesome surveys might have slightly more frequent surveys. You might see them at the nine month time frame versus the 13, 14 month time frame as well. Uh, surveys on the annual surveys, they come in, they, like I said, they're unannounced. They say we're here for your annual survey. Um, it's typically three to four surveyors. They're there for roughly three days, uh, depending on the census. Last year in Central, they were only there for two. We only had 15 people in the building, so they didn't have a whole lot to look at. Um, but typically three days, uh, they come in and they look at everything. So there's certain things that they specifically have to look at and have to review on every single survey. Um, and then the majority of the time they spend talking to residents. So the first two days they go out and they talk to every resident they can and ask them pretty general questions about how do you like it here? Do you feel safe here? Um, how do you like the food? Uh, kind of general questions to gauge how our residents feel about the facility. And then based on both those interviews, um, observations, so they watch meal pass, they watch med pass, they watch cares, um, based on the interviews, observations, and then record review is how they dig deeper into finding if there were any issues or anything that they need to issue a citation for. Typically by the third day, about midday is the first time we have any idea of anything going on in survey. In years past, um, before 2018, they used to do an exit conference every day and tell you, this is what we're looking at, here's a heads up. They don't do that anymore. Um, they just tell you on the last day what's going on. We can sometimes gauge what they're looking at based on what they ask for. They might ask for care plans, they might ask for policies, uh, records, things like that. Um, there's a lot less of that now because they do log into our electronic medical records instead of us having to print everything for them, which is very nice. In years past, we used to do anything they wanted to look at, we had to print a copy for. So we're saving a lot of trees. Um, they log on to their own computers and log on to our system and then can do all of their record review um, on a computer, which is nice. And then at the end of that third day, they issue us any citations we might have. Those are always preliminary citations. They can change, they can go away. Other ones can be added. They are just what the surveyors on site are proposing be cited. Then after that, they go back to their office in Eau Claire and they then work with their regional directors and write up what's called a statement of deficiency. So those all need to be approved and then they are issued to us. Then once we get the uh, statement of deficiency, which is roughly 10 business days after they leave, um, we then have 10 calendar days to write what's called a plan of correction. So any citations that we receive, we write up a plan and then that gets submitted back to the state and then they can either approve or deny that plan. Um, typically our plan of corrections have had what's called a desk review. 
So we just send all the information in, we show them what we did to fix any issues, and then they just send us back a letter that says it was approved via desk review, and then we get a follow-up letter with our recertification. Um, in the case that there might be a more severe citation, they might do a follow-up survey. So they might come back and just check on that whatever that issue was that they want to review. Um, and then they would, if everything checked out, then they would issue that recertification letter at that point. Um, we can also, those are annual surveys. Um, we can also get surveys on complaints um, or self-report investigations. So anytime that we have a self-report for an abuse, a neglect, theft, um, injury of unknown origin, elopements, anything that we have to report to the state that there was an allegation of, um, they can come in and do a self-report investigation survey. Basically, they come in and just look at what we did regarding that self-report and make sure we did everything appropriately. Or they can come in on a complaint survey, which would be typically anonymous complaints. Um, either family members, staff can submit them, really anybody can, residents themselves. Um, they can submit an anonymous complaint to the state. And then depending on the severity of the complaint, uh, surveyors would come in um, either right away if it's something very, very bad, um, they have to come in within 48 hours. If it's something that is less severe, they have more time. Um, we have seen complaint surveys come as far as six months after the person discharged. Um, so sometimes those are a little bit difficult because especially those long ones out, um, we had one that the resident had discharged and all the staff involved no longer worked at the facility. Um, so we didn't have much to give the surveyor except what we submitted. Um, and that was, it all worked out fine, but there's sometimes some lag time in that as well. Those surveys can come at any point in time. Um, so we don't have to be in a survey window for that. Uh, they can show up whenever. Uh, we had one time we had a complaint survey show up a week after our annual survey. So sometimes they're lumped together. Sometimes they um, come out of cycle. It just kind of depends on when complaints come in um, or, and on the surveyor's schedules. And then the final thing I had on here that we talk a lot about um, is PBJ reporting. Um, we talk about that quite- Carmen, Carmen sure. is, uh, on the surveys, is there still a rating system, a star rating system? Do they, yes. they still use that? Yes, they okay. do. Okay. Um, so there's a star rating, uh, thanks Dr. Brown. Uh, there is a star rating system that is public knowledge. So it is on medicare.gov. Um, you can look up any nursing home in the country to see their star rating. It is five out of five stars. Um, is the rating system. Um, it is comprised of the inspection results, so survey results. Um, so both the health side, and then we also get what's called life safety code inspections. Um, so while the health and surveyors are there, one of the days there will be an engineer from the state that comes and makes sure we're following all the fire code stuff as well. Um, so they're part of the same recertification process, but they're another surveyor. They're typically only there about a half a day. They do a walk through the facility and then also look at all of our records for things like fire drills and generator testing and emergency preparedness and things like that. Um, so those, the ratings from your health inspection and your life safety code inspection um, start first. And then based on whatever star you have from that rating, then they add in um, staffing. So our staffing is submitted through this PBJ system, um, which I'll get to in a minute. And then also adding in what's called quality metrics, um, which is directly derived from our MDS. So that big data set that we submit for each resident. So, and then that all gets added together to be part of the, to compose the five-star rating. Um, the rating system is a great tool for families and people to um, pick where they want to go for a nursing home. Um, there is some flaws to it because if a facility has one bad survey, it could pull down their rating or um, PBJ reporting also can cause issues with that. So PBJ reporting is payroll-based journal entries. So we submit those quarterly. That is how we get our staffing five-star rating. 
And there's very specific rules regarding um, how things are reported. Um, it is a lot of data entry. Um, it is a lot of information that gets sent to the state. It basically tracks every 15 minute increment that any person is working at the nursing home. So CNAs, nurses, homemakers, um, myself, director of nursing, um, medical director, um, any position that anybody is working at the nursing home gets recorded. Um, and then it all gets submitted to create that five-star rating. One of the issues that can come up with that is if there is any errors in reporting, um, it can cause your staffing rating to go down to a one star for one reporting period. Um, even if it is a computer error, if it is a typo error, um, they can do what's called a PBJ audit. And if they find an error rate of, I don't remember the number off the top of my head, but there's a level of error rate you can have. If it is above that, you automatically go down to a one star, even if you had way more staff than necessary. Um, so there is some flaws with that five-star rating program as well. Um, so we always say take it with a grain of salt. <laughs> um, we've been very proud to have high five-star ratings of either fives or fours um, consistently for many, many years. Um, but there is also some nuances to that as well that someone looking at it that doesn't know the whole system might not understand. So those are the items I had on my list, unless there's any questions or anything specific, um, or maybe if there's something from the members that have been here for a while that was helpful, I can share more as well. I have a question if I may. Yeah, yeah go right ahead. All right, uh, what is our rating? Um, so two of the three are five stars right now and one is a four star. Okay, thank you. And go ahead, Barb. Oh, sorry. Yep, you're on. Okay. Um, what is what would be like the nature of some of the complaints that come through? Sure. Um, they can be kind of about anything. Um, so they range from um, we recently had a complaint that a gentleman um, filed a complaint actually with the ADRC, and then they're required to tell the state that there was a complaint and that was about um, going out on leave or pass with people. Um, and we had no, we actually had a survey about that last week, um, which was no citations. Um, we were in compliance. Um, he goes out on pass all the time. <laughs> um, so they can be things as small as that. Mm -hmm. um, and then all the way up to if there's a complaint about an alleged abuse account, um, so sometimes the something could be something we actually submitted ourselves, but then the family also filed a complaint about, um, so they can overlap. Um, sometimes they're about food. Um, sometimes they're um, about medication passes. Um, they've been about specific staff before. If a family doesn't like a staff member, um, they can really be about anything. Mm -hmm. Um, and then depending on the severity is what triggers whether the state comes immediately or if they come at a later point. Um, so very infrequently is it something that they come in the next couple of days kind of thing. Um, and then for the self-report surveys, what triggers those is if it's something drastic. Um, so we did have a recent self-report survey that we had um, a person that had um, what's called an injury of unknown origin, which means they have a significant injury, whether it be a fracture, a bruise, a cut, something that seems out of the norm of not just like a normal bump on the hand kind of thing. Um, and if we don't have a rationale of where it came from and the resident can't tell us where it came from, um, we have to report that. So we had that recently um, and they came in to review that because it was fairly significant. Um, the individual we believe fell um, and she would have been able to get herself up, but she had severe dementia and was not able to tell us that that's what happened. So I wondered if that would be the case for yep. those kinds of things. Yeah, sometimes that is the case. Um, and that's a lot of times when we've had investigations um, about reportables, um, it is difficult because a lot of our residents do have dementia. Um, the rule in nursing home and definitely our policy or 
how we view it is it's better to report things and have it be nothing. Um, so we always err on the side of caution and no matter how wild and crazy the story might seem, um, even if we're 99.9% .9 sure it didn't happen, um, we always report things and do the investigation to prove that it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. Good question. I have one more question. Mm -hmm. um, so there's the, the three separate entities. Um, what's the level of shared resources that can take place among those three? Sure. Um, so there's some things that have to be specific for each one. Um, one of which is director of nursing. So we have a campus director of nursing, but then each of the three um, buildings has their own director of nursing. That is because that is required to be a full-time position in each nursing home. Um, but then, for example, an administrator can be shared between um, technically two nursing homes, but we have a waiver for it. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm shared between the three. Um, things like food is a really big one that is shared between the three. So we do do cost allocations so that the cost of the food and labor is split. Um, but all of the food, for the most part, is made in the central neighborhood in our main kitchen and then brought out to the other households, um, except for breakfast is made to order in the households. Um, so that's shared, but the funding for it is divided out. So we have an allocation um, that we directly relate to census. So because central is down in census, we have less of each thing allocated to central. Um, and then ordering and things like that we do for medical supplies and stuff like that. Um, we order based on the needs of each building. So thanks, of course. A question, I might've missed this, but does enrollment and hospice affect payer source or payer amount? Um, it can affect payer source depending on the person. Um, so we do have hospice with private pay hospice. And we have Medicaid hospice. Um, if they were on Medicare, they would have to be removed from Medicare to be on hospice. You cannot be on both um, as Medicare is short-term rehabilitation based. So if someone is deciding to be on hospice, they don't qualify for Medicare anymore. Um, the one that it really does trigger differences is VA because someone might not be able to be on their VA contract with us if they're not on hospice, but then when they become hospice, might qualify for VA because the VA has different qualifications for hospice. So that could change payer source, um, but that's really the only one that makes much of a difference. Besides that, hospice is typically just um, an added service for our residents. So they have more people coming in and checking on them. Um, sometimes it can relate to having more showers per week or things like that, some more therapeutic care. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for me at all? Yeah, that was a really Thanks. good rundown. Uh, Carly, uh, we've been here, but I, it sure was good to hear it again. Uh, and okay. Well, thank you very much, Carmen, of for course. remembering to do that. Uh, and now, uh, who would be doing sick day then? <laughs> Me. <laughs> and there's a, um, a bit of a joke today because um, Jane is normally here and Scott's normally here, but it's just me today. So, and Chris is online for when we get to the um, employment, but you're going to hear a lot from me. <laughs> um, okay. So Quality Assurance Steering Committee, um, or that is commonly known as QAPI, so it's Quality Assur Assurance Performance Improvement. Um, I mentioned to Chairman Kinnear that I might be making an acronym breakdown for everybody because I do use a lot of acronyms, um, and I try to explain them after I hear myself say them. But if you ever don't know an acronym I said, please ask, and I can explain what it is. Um, so QAPI is how um, is a federally mandated program for all skilled nursing facilities. Um, it is a program that we are required to have at a minimum of quarterly. We do it monthly as with the size of our campus. Um, we have a lot of moving parts. There's a lot of stuff going on, um, as well as if there really is something that we feel is a quality issue that we want to change or fix. We want to do that faster than in a quarter. Um, as well as we try to fix things immediately, but the QAPI committee is really about 
um, checking if our fixes worked um, and making sure that we are tracking how things are going and if they didn't work, finding what we could do differently, um, things like that. So we do meet monthly. There's also four subcommittees that meet on a regular basis. Um, so the idea is having smaller groups of people working on specific things instead of everybody looking at everything. Uh, so we have safety subcommittee, we have clinical care subcommittee, we have quality of life subcommittee, um, which is we kind of look at the quality of life of our residents from every angle. So we have someone from every level of staff on this committee, as well as every department, because um, there might be something that a CNA hears from residents that I'm not going to hear because it's not some big issue, but it might really affect their day-to-day -day quality of life. Um, so we look at how our residents view our facility and what we can do for them from every angle. Um, and then finally, we have corporate compliance as another subcommittee. So all of those subcommittees meet regularly and then report up to the overall QAPI Quality Assurance Steering Committee. So every month um, during my report, I give a br brief report on what we talked about in the overall committee um, and then see if there's any questions. Um, this month was pretty standard. Uh, our um, quality of life committee gave their quarterly report, um, went over everything that that committee has been doing. Uh, there wasn't anything out of the norm. Um, we did talk a lot about vaccines this month um, because we are offering the RSV vaccine at the facility. We had some trouble getting it as it was in short supply right away, um, but we have now gotten it and our residents who have wanted it have received that vaccine. Um, so we talked about that at length. Um, we had given our um, most recent dose of the COVID vaccine quite a while ago now, um, the end of October. Um, but we're hoping to do all three at once uh, so we don't have to go around and stab people multiple times. Our residents don't really like that very much, um, but we did flu shots and um, COVID shots at one time and then the RSV shots separately. Um, we also talked about um, policy structures and um, policy review planning and things like that at our last QAPI committee. Um, we had noticed that we had had some policies that were being reviewed or changed and their communication of um, how those were going out and things like that weren't always the greatest. So we worked as a team to figure out a plan of how to more streamline that so that if a policy changes, it gets to the right people um, as well as goes through the right approval process. So we also worked on that at that committee meeting. Any questions about QAPI at all? I have a question if I may. Thank sure. you. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, with these vaccines being given and multiple, at, you know, multiple vaccines at, at a time, uh, my concern is uh, how the, the uh, residents react uh, either negatively or positively to um, side effects, that kind of thing. Uh, is there any tracking regarding that and, and how that affects their care? Sure. Um, yeah, so anytime that we have a vaccine given, um, there is a monitoring period for all residents so that is added into our electronic medical record system. Um, we did not have any adverse effects from this round of dosage. Um, we always clear um, vaccine administration with our medical director and our pharmacy. Um, so this time around, um, in the past, they had actually said not to give multiple different things at the same time when the COVID vaccines were brand new, um, they advised against it. So you had to wait. If you had just gotten a flu vaccine, you had to wait two weeks to get your COVID vaccines. And um, there was quite a bit of um, debate over when to give them and things. Um, in this current uh, flu and COVID vaccine season, um, they was actually advised to give them at the same time um, with the only thing of doing different arms um, to um, mainly for any kind of skin reaction to see that, but we hadn't, we didn't have any adverse effects um, besides a couple of people feeling a little under the weather, but um, nothing lasting. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Looks like the next one. Okay. Um, so then Chris is on remotely to do employment activity report. Good morning. Can everybody hear me? Yes, it sounds good. Thank you. 
Uh, so in your packet, you had the re employment report for the month of November. Um, <clears throat> we did have a, you know, a number of in-house direct hire interviews, which is nice. Um, on the, the flip side of that, we did have some resignations. Um, and some of the resignations came from, you know, the upcoming December college graduation, taking other jobs, that type of thing. Um, just kind of the, you know, to be expected when you employ a group of students. Um, uh, but nothing, nothing negative for resignation reasons. Um, if we go down to open positions, those were adjusted with the coming and going of agency staff and, you know, kind of adjusting for um, in-house staff leaving. Uh, we have another month of no work comp lost hours. And the number of shifts for November um, missed for COVID type issues were 29 shifts or roughly 221 hours. Um, and that includes missed time for our agency staff because um, those hours need to be filled. Somebody needs to be here, even if it's agency. Um, so it's a pretty short one. It generally is over the holidays. Or when you have a holiday month that lessens, you know, it seems like a lot of people aren't looking for jobs during, you know, like from Thanksgiving through the new year. So a little slower on that. Uh, Chris, so we have a question from uh, Barb. Go ahead. Um, when you say filled with agency, I don't understand what that means. Yep. So we have our in-house staff, which are Dunn County employees, and we have agency staff which are contracted staff from a, a nursing pool. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, in, in line with that, uh, Chris, where it says open positions and you have the box, could you explain just a little bit uh, yep. what that means to all positions total? or? or... Yeah. So for example, in the RN column, we have 12 total RN positions open. So that could be a mix of full-time, part-time. There's just, there's 12 positions open. Three of those open positions are filled with agency nurses or contracted nurses. And that would mean that nine are open? Correct. Okay. Um, I'd also like to add for the new folks, um, for 2023, we were budgeted for full census and full staff. Um, so some of those we would not fill, I mean, we would if we could, because um, then we could open every single bed. Um, but with our current census level, some of those would also not be full. Um, and then in 2024, we budgeted um, with a closed household and adjusted the staff accordingly. So um, some of those positions would not be filled with our current census level. Uh, I see a, a full-time RN uh except a director of nursing position in a different facility. That's a step up for someone mm -hmm. that's really looking forward to it or? Yeah, so that person um, had previously worked at a different chain of nursing homes, um, one of the ones that closed and then came to us. Um, and then that chain of nursing homes had a director of nursing position open. So she got recruited back to that position, so. Now you, you talked uh, that was some of the nursing homes in the area closing and uh, are we still getting a few more people from maybe Mayo that they want to come back or other nursing homes? Yeah, uh, that's slowed a little bit as we kind of had an influx when those facilities closed themselves. Um, so when one of them closed, we didn't get much because that was the main reason they were closing is they didn't have any staff. Um, and then when this, one of the other ones closed, we did get quite an influx of CNAs, especially um, a couple nurses. Um, and one of those is this person. Um, and then we have seen a few in the past couple of weeks from um, one of the other facilities that changed licensure from a nursing home to an assisted living um, because at first they kept all of their staff. Um, but now due to the lowering in acuity from um, nursing home to assisted living. They don't require as many staff, so they've been cutting some hours. So we have seen um, some applications from that facility as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. While we're still on this page quick, I am just going to go over the COVID stuff a little bit because I didn't have it as a separate agenda item just because there wasn't much to share. I don't believe I had it on there. Um, 
So the only thing I was going to add is that there's the shifts that are on here. Um, we have seen an influx in staff positive cases recently. Um, that'll most likely hit the next report because it has been in December. Um, but we have had a handful of staff positive cases in the last couple of weeks. Fortunately, we've had no positive residents. Um, so, but it does put our households into outbreaks again. So we're testing. Um, mask wearing is required during an outbreak. Um, only in the households that it affects. Uh, so currently all three households in West are in an outbreak and then Fireside and Central. Um, East is all currently in the clear, knock on wood, and Deerview is also, um, they were in an outbreak and now have um, completed their 14 day outbreak. And you mentioned that during that outbreak, you can't accept anybody into that Correct. Uh, entire building? Just to the household that so. it affects. Mm -hmm. Um, and currently our East building is full um, and then Deerview, I believe, ha only has one open room. So um, we don't have really anywhere we can admit to at the moment um, because the places with openings have COVID outbreaks. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other any other questions from anyone? I, yeah, a quick one. So is the COVID very strong? I mean, they're, they got, are they really sick or their symptoms are pretty... Sure. Um, the majority of the people that we've had test positive with COVID have been pretty fine. Um, Cold-like symptoms, things like that. That being said, the majority of them are very young. Um, we haven't had any residents test positive recently. Um, we've had a lot of college and high school age staff test positive, so they are more likely to have lesser symptoms by age too. Um, I don't have any information about anyone that's older if they're having severe COVID because fortunately we have not had any of that yet. Thank you. All right, 6C. All right, this is the one we've all been waiting for. <laughs> 6C, CNA training program. So I have good news. Um, our CNA training program after years of talking about this has been officially approved. Um, as of 12, 2023, um, we received approval from the state. Um, so they approved our facility, approved the space, the training program through um, the company that we're working with. Um, and next week, I believe it's the second, um, the Paula Gibson who works for that company is coming to meet with us and set everything up. Um, for those of you who are new, we've been training about talking about the training program for quite some time, going back and forth on if we can do it ourselves um, and or if we should use an outside entity that uses our space. Um, and we've went with that option as it takes a lot less staff time as well as they do all of the recruiting, all of the payment management, all of that kind of stuff. Um, but it still gets CNAs trained in our facility versus somewhere else and just doing clinicals with us. So the idea is people stay where they're comfortable. Um, if they're becoming a CNA, they live close to us. If they get comfortable with our facility, we might have them stay on as CNAs with us. Um, so we're really excited about that. So hopefully um, sometime early 2024, we'll have our first CNA class. The only comment is whoopee. <laughs> I knew that would be an exciting one. No, and way to, way to stick with it. Uh, you, you've really had to do that. I, I you would just take so many. I mean, there's just so many in that class that you can have, or how big are you talking about? For yeah, so I believe, um, I, and don't quote me on this because I'm not 100% sure, I believe it's eight to a teacher. So it would depend on how many teachers that company can um, bring in uh, to teach. Uh, so, and they could have multiple classes during the same time frame. So we could have a daytime one and a PM one. Um, I know with our current demographic of um, what Paula had said, they've already kind of figured out people that might be interested in our area to take the classes based on people who've contact them, contacted them to take classes at some of their other facilities in Chippewa or Eau Claire that the people that have reached out to them from our area typically have said they wanted PM classes. So their students or people that have other jobs, things like that. Um, so depending on the time frame, we could have multiple classes going at once too. 
um, especially in the summer. I mean, most of the people taking CNA courses are high school or college students. Mm -hmm. So during the summer, we could do a, a couple different sessions as well. So there's so many hours required for this? It's 75 hours of training. Um, so that is actually something that came up throughout COVID. It used to be 120 hours of training. Um, that was one of those state versus federal regulations. The federal regulation was 75. Wisconsin state was 120. Um, during COVID, when we needed more staff right away, um, one of the um, emergency regulations that was put in place was lowering Wisconsin's requirement to the state requirement, um, which they did. And then now they've just kept it. So it's 75 hours. So that's classroom and the, okay. Correct. Everything. Mm -hmm. It's typically done over like a four to six week period. Okay, that's what I was gonna ask. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Dr. Brown? The organization that's uh, running this, is are they private or are they affiliated with nur a nursing program? They're private, um, so they are their own entity. Um, they have partnered with other skilled nursing facilities, so they've partnered with the Dove Corporation in um, Chippewa. Um, so they have a training center uh, that's actually in the old Wasota home, um, and then uh, they'll be with us as well. And, and the students pay pay for this this education? Uh, yes, most do. Um, so there is some programs, it's called, or a program called WIS Caregivers, which can um, help get the class for free, but then it also comes with, um, they have to go to a specific training program, which this would be one of the certified ones, because um, we're a certified facility through it. Then they have to stay on at the facility for a certain amount of time, and then they get reimbursed for their class. Um, so there is options to not have it be paid for um, by the student, but they can also pay privately for it too. Would it be worthwhile for neighbors to pay the tuition for some of the for students if they agreed to work here for a period of time? Um, it's something that we can look into. Um, I think that would require a board decision on that. Um, the one thing that we did run into when we did the original WIS Caregiver Program is that people stayed until the day they got the check and then left. <laughs> um, and it's a little bit harder for the reimbursement period of things, but it's something we could look into. So how much are you talking about cost for this whole thing? I don't know the number off the top of my head. It's a few hundred dollars. Okay. Mm -hmm. I have a quick question, if I may. Yeah, go right ahead. All right. Uh, is there any type of state or federal grant program to hopefully, you know, consider to defer some of the costs and educational training? Yeah. So that's that WIS Caregivers program is a state grant program. Um, okay. So All that right. is, yep, that is, they started that and I believe... 2017, 2018, around that time frame. Um, and it was a few year program. And then they re-upped it last year, the year before, um, and changed some things about it and made it a little bit um, easier for the facilities versus tracking how long people had been there and things like that. Um, but it used to be that if they stayed, I think it was six months, they got a certain amount of money back and then they got their classes paid for. And they've made that a little bit more simple that it's more direct through the program. Um, so that is an option through the state. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions about CNA training? Yeah, looks like we can go to the next one. Thank you. All right. So resident referral report. So that is in your packet as well. We go over this every month. Um, it is the referrals we get, uh, admissions we take, um, those we don't take, and then census related. So um, at the beginning of the month, we had 109 as our census. And um, this is through November. So it's always hard because our meeting is at the end of each month. So we're looking at a whole month ahead before that. But um, so this is through November. Uh, 109 residents. We had 75 referrals, which is a little bit down. Um, again, people typically don't come to the nursing home during the holidays. It's normally right after the holidays. Um, we've been more typically seeing above 100 for referrals. Um, number of residents admitted, we had eight admitted to the facility this month. Uh, we had 67 not admitted. Um, we have a description of why 
Um, we used to go into specifics on every single person not admitted, um, but now that we have more not admitted than admitted, we don't go into that, um, as well as if we aren't able to admit, like right now when we don't have any open beds, um, we don't go through the reason with the person. We just say we don't have a bed. So um, that more encompasses the whole, but there's many reasons that we wouldn't admit someone. Um, even if we did have a bed, we do assess every admission. At the end of the month, we had 112 residents at the facility. We had zero residents transferred to another facility. We had three residents pass away this month, which is close to average. It typically ranges um, from three to five, and sometimes it gets upwards to 10, but um, that's typically average for a month. And then we had five residents discharge home. That number is higher than normal, and that's primarily because when we opened Fireside in October, um, we started admitting more short-term rehab individuals. So um, more admissions also means more discharges, which is a good thing. Um, it means that we got them healthy enough to go to a lower level of care. Um, and then top referral sources, um, it's our three normal ones. Um, so Sacred Heart and Eau Claire, and then the two Mayos both here and Eau Claire. Any questions on referrals? Oh, I mean, uh, this is not able to come due to testing positive. How many would you say you had of patients that came that were um, that you had that testing positive? Or did you say I don't have a number off you the top know. of my head. Um, I know we had a couple that were planned. So we have the hospital take a test right before they come to us. Um, that way, if we can avoid having an outbreak, because um, if they come to us then test positive, then that household's in an outbreak. So we have the hospital complete a COVID test right before they come to us um, to make sure that we're not exposing people in our facility. Um, so I know it happens a couple times a month. Um, it's typically we have someone supposed to come, it's all lined up, and then the day that they're supposed to come to us, they test positive. But it's normally one or two a month. It's not a big number. Yeah, Dr. Brown? Well, every time I hear this, I'm a little amazed that these hospitals would be unaware that the patient tested positive unless you required it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Happens that regularly. We actually, um, so we also test when they come to us. So we have an ample amount of um, COVID tests at the facility. They are free to us from the government. We have a whole boardroom full of them. Um, so we use them when they come to us as well. We have them test before they come. We test when they come um, just to be extra cautious. And we actually got some pushback from our local hospital that we were one of the only nursing homes requiring them to test prior to coming to us. Um, so we said, okay, we'll try it and we'll just test. And then the week we did that, we had someone come to us that was already positive. And so we went back to requiring the hospital to test. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. There's no other questions on that one. I'll move to environmental and facilities report. Um, so normally Scott is here. Um, I'm not sure if he's on vacation this week or just busy. Um, so I will go over kind of a brief overview. Um, he might have more that I may be not aware of, um, but we'll have him fill us in next month as well. Um, one thing that would be on here is since we did have West survey, we also had West life safety code survey. Um, so that is conducted with an engineer from the state, like I mentioned earlier, and typically done with um, our maintenance team as they are the ones who do the majority of the life safety code preventative maintenance, the fire drills, um, all keeping the building up and running. Um, so Scott normally comes over for that as well. So it was Scott and Brady were with the surveyor. Um, as and sometimes I'm with them, but they came at the same time as health this time. So I was with the health team surveyors. Um, so they do a record review of all of the different things that Brady does to make sure the facility is in tip top shape and that we're doing all the things to prevent any sort of major catastrophes like fires or generator issues or roof leaking, all of that kind of stuff that could cause issues. Um, the surveyor goes over all of that, makes sure we're in compliance, which we were, um, and then they also do a tour of the facility. Uh, there was two minor citations for this, which is very normal. There's very few times that there isn't something seen. 
Um, one was that a corridor door was left open. So no doors that are in a corridor can be left open without being used at the time. Um, so that's things like our closets um, in the hallways and laundry rooms and things like that. Um, staff must have gotten something out of one of the doors and didn't close it. Um, very minor, we close the door, educate staff that we need to have the doors closed. Um, and then the other one was related to the sealant on a door too. So things that can be fixed really easily, nothing too major. Um, other things that could have been seen on something like this is they always check to make sure the sidewalks are level so that there's not tripping hazards. Um, that was all fine. They always check to make sure anything that can't have um, something in front of it. So um, our uh, electricity panels, the breakers, those can't, they have to have a barrier around them where there isn't stuff piled in front of it. So just little things that um, could cause issues in an emergency is what they look for. Um, things like we can't have door stoppers in nursing homes. So you can't stop, have a door stopper because in the case of a fire, you have to be able to shut the door immediately. Um, so just little nuanced things that are specific to nursing homes um, that the surveyors go around and look at. So that all went very well for life safety code. Um, outside of the survey, uh, I know our garage doors have been ordered and scheduled. I believe they're supposed to be here this week question mark on that, if that's still happening. That was the last report I got, but our garage doors are supposed to be here um, this week, which um, if you weren't on the committee at that point, um, we had garage door issues and we use contingency funding um, because in the case of an emergency, that could be a big issue as well as we've been fortunate that the weather hasn't been super cold, um, but they could cause issues if we were having them stuck open in the really, really cold weather. So um, we have replaced or are working on replacing all three garage doors, but those are have been ordered and are supposed to be arriving very soon. Um, besides that, I know that they've been working on some heat pumps um, and things like that, which is an every year thing, um, which again, fortunately our weather has been pretty mild this year. So we haven't had issues with that. Um, and same thing with snow removal and stuff. That's always a big topic um, for us as um, we have to have snow removal 24 seven um, because there's people at our facilities 24 seven. Um, so a little bit different than say this building that if it snows on a Saturday, we may not have it plowed right <laughs> away. We have to have the nursing home stuff plowed right away. Um, so that's always an added stressor on the maintenance department. Um, but fortunately, we haven't had much for snow or things like that. So any questions for facilities or environment? No, looks good. Thank you. Okay. So the next one is Wisconsin County Homes Update and Supplemental Payment. Um, so this is another nuance that we talk a lot about um, is supplemental payment. Um, so there is a difference between ownership of a county home and um, a private home that's owned by either a not-for-profit corporation or owned by a for-profit corporation. Um, so there are some nuances to running a county home. Um, and we are part of what's called the Wisconsin County Homes Association. Uh, so we meet twice or every other month um, to go over things that are specific to county homes, um, things that we're having issues with, um, and payment structures and different things that affect us differently than other um, similar entities. Um, and the biggest topic that is typically talked about every single month is supplemental payment, um, which is a payment system that the state has in place that basically helps county homes um, make up deficits from Medicaid. So because um, this dates all the way back to when county homes were the expectation that they just took everybody that needed help um, and way back into almost the asylum hospital days um, where it was, this was extra payment because we take more Medicaid than any other nursing homes, which is still true. Um, county homes still do take more Medicaid residents than any other nursing home. We do not base admission on payer source. Um, there are some <clears throat> privately owned nursing homes that do. Um, there's quotas basically is we have this percentage of this payer source, this percentage of this payer source, 
and so on. Um, we take it based on need. Um, as long as we can meet the needs of the resident, we do not take payer source into um, account as long as we can meet their needs. Um, and that is basically all county nursing homes do that. So um, to offset some of the losses from the Medicaid system for county homes, because we do that, there's a system called supplemental payment. It is something that we get a payment for twice a year. Um, it is based on the state's fiscal year. So the state um, starts in July um, instead of uh, January 1. So we get a payment normally at the end of our fiscal year, so sometime around December, and then one in June at the end of the state fiscal year. The one in December is considered an interim payment, even though it's at the end of our year, it's the halfway point of their year. Um, and that is normally just a guess at that point. And then the end of the year, June payment is the final number. So that number can change. They give us a number in December and they're like, this is what we think it's going to be. Um, at that point, uh, audits aren't necessarily done for the state and rates aren't necessarily set. And there's all sorts of different nuances that can still change from now to then. Um, but they typically give an interim rate or an interim payment and then a final payment in June. This year, they changed how supplemental payment is being distributed. Um, they changed the formula for it as well as split it up between both um, regular uh, Medicaid and hospice Medicaid um, to try to capture more of the costs for hospice residents that might be on Medicaid. Um, in doing so, it changed the amounts of payments for most, if not all, of the nursing homes um, based on what we had anticipated and based on what um, the changes had, everybody's changed. Um, and this is something we've been talking about for quite a few months, especially in the budgeting for next year's, was we anticipated our supplemental payment to go down um, primarily because our rates were going up. So it's supposed to offset the losses. So in theory, if our rates pay enough, we wouldn't get supplemental payment um, if they didn't have losses from Medicaid specifically. Um, that being said, it is the first time they're doing this change um, and there were lots of errors and they actually admitted that there were errors and that we could appeal and do different things. Um, because there were 16 nursing homes, um, and we were one of them, that received no supplemental payment in December. So um, in for reference point, um, typically a supplemental payment would be a few hundred thousand dollars every payment. Um, so the overall total supplemental payment um, allotment for the whole state is $31 million dollars. They only distributed, in theory, 22 ish million dollars. I think it was roughly 22, a little bit less than, is their projected amount that they will distribute by the end of the year. There, like I said, 16 nursing homes got nothing in the interim. Um, with that being said, we are appealing that. Um, we still won't get anything this year for it, um, but it would change our final payment in June. So, um, more to come on that. It's not great news, um, but they did disallow some cost on it that we think we'll be able to capture. Um, and then that would change the look of it because based on the state's calculation, we did not have a Medicaid loss, um, which is just simply inaccurate. So we are appealing that. Um, and then when we find out the finals, we'll have an update as, as well. We've already submitted the appeal for that. Go ahead, Barb. Um, how many uh, county nursing homes are there in the state? Um, there's 30 some different nurse or counties that have nursing homes. There's 40 facilities. And some have multiples um, like us. Okay. okay. So, and the majority of the money was distributed to Dane County, which is the average every year. The majority of it is distributed to Dane County's nursing home. Um, they do have a very, very acute population and take a lot of psychiatric 
and mm -hmm. um, hard to place individuals. Um, so they their payment was, I believe, nine million dollars. So um, ours has been roughly in the seven hundred thousand for the overall payment in the last couple of years. It has been decreasing as our rates have gotten better. Um, but this and supplemental payment is based on last year's audit. So um, we definitely did have a Medicaid loss last year. So um, I do think we will be able to collect some of that money. Anyone else? Oh, thank you. All right. Um, so now we're on to West Survey. Um, so I've talked a little bit about this already. Um, that we did have West survey two weeks ago. Um, so like I said, every building is surveyed separately. Um, our West um, building was right at about 13 and a half months um, from their last annual survey. Um, our, we did not have our best survey ever for this facility. Um, it, we did have a couple of citations, um, including one citation that was a little bit higher of a level than what we're used to having. Um, it was not to the extreme of what's considered an immediate jeopardy citation. Um, so we can be issued what's called an IJ, um, which is the highest level of citations. Um, if you receive an IJ, those come with fines. Um, they come with having to fix it before the surveyors will exit your building. Um, and the fines are by day. Um, that's a big whole nother thing. Um, fortunately, we did not have an IJ for the situation, um, but we did receive what's called a level G citation. So it's a step below that. Um, it is a, the largest citation we've had in at least the five years I've been here, and I believe many before that. Um, it was related to a resident-to-resident -resident altercation um, that um, a resident um, had an altercation with another resident. Um, which resulted in one of the residents falling. Um, we did an assessment, did all the things with that, but um, due to the residents' aggressive behavior, they thought we should have been able to prevent it. Um, so we are working through that process um, of submitting what's called our plan of correction, um, potentially doing an informal dispute resolution, which is our option to fight the citation as the resident had about... 15 different interventions in place to try to prevent it, and they didn't work. Um, so we tried, but unfortunately things do happen. Um, so we're working on that. We just got our statement of deficiency yesterday for that. Um, so we will be submitting our plan of correction and potentially an IDR this week. Um, I do have a call with the individuals from DQA today um, to discuss some of that and timeframes um, for things like that. And then also with um, our long-term care attorneys because they do uh, support IDRs. Um, we have, uh, through our membership with Leading Age, we have support from um, long-term care and healthcare attorneys who help with that process as well. So um, who I have another call with um, tomorrow. So um, more to come on that as um, we do believe that we had um, interventions in place, but unfortunately um, we can't always control what residents do. Um, it was in our dementia unit um, and things like that. So um, there's a difficult situation. Unfortunately, everyone was eventually okay. Um, there wasn't any further issues after that, but um, we do have to go through that process now. Jeez. Anybody questions? Okay. Yeah, that's the first time we've had, you know, a sad face yeah. telling us about the, the thing. So nice job there, really. Um, bus update. Yes. So I bookended this with good news. Mm -hmm. um, so we started with the CNA training program as good news. So not so great news. And then bus update. Um, so the RFP did go out for our bus and we did have a bid chosen. I don't remember the name of the company offhand. Um, Scott worked directly with Sarah on that, um, Sarah Stabenow and finance. Um, so we did have a bus company chosen um, and a bus has been ordered. And we are hoping to have a bus on site in mid-February. So which was much, much sooner than we had originally anticipated. Um, when we had first looked at these, they were saying 
six to eight months out um, for buses, if not longer. Um, we got really fortunate that one of our bids had some on their lot and were actually just needed some conversions to make them be what we needed them to be based on wheelchair spots and things like that. So we are looking at having a new bus in early 2024. Well, I thought you were going to say 2025. Is there, the townships uh, are ordering <laughs> trucks and so forth out into 2025, or they yeah. ordered in 2022 and they won't get them at 24. It's it's really tough. So that's great news. Yeah, yeah, we got really really lucky with the company that had just happened to have a couple on their lot that were very close to what we needed. They just didn't have enough um, wheelchair spots, um, which is something that they could easily convert for us. Um, so we actually we're going to have one even sooner. Um, so when Scott first told me the dates, he was all bummed. I was like, no, I'm so excited. That's mm -hmm. fine. Um, so uh, we're very, very excited that we will have a bus soon. And Great. perfectly before summer when we have more outings and things like that too. Great. Okay. And now uh, I'm going to just keep you going here. You, you take Jane's, Jane's spot now, huh? Yes, I will do my best. Um, so in your packets is the financial reports. Um, so typically Jane does this, she's on vacation today. Um, so I will do my best to go over them. Um, so in your reports, there is first, um, there's the aging report in here. Um, so this is the, um, as you can see, it's the bar graph. Uh, the different colors represent the different buckets on if they're current, if they're older. Um, so that big blue bottom one is current. So that one being the biggest section is a good thing. Um, this is higher than what it had been, and that's primarily due to our increase in Medicare census. So those are higher payer sources, um, so we are waiting for more money for them, but we also take a little bit longer to bill those um, because of the MDS process and things like that. Um, so that's an okay thing to see that bucket higher, as long as it's the blue and orange that are making it higher, because um, those are the more current um, charges. Um, so that being higher doesn't necessarily mean bad. It does actually mean more money coming in um, from higher census. Any questions on aging? All right. The next one is the campus census. See other um, bar graph. Um, so this shows the breakdown of our different payer sources and where we're at um, for census on these. So as you can see, Medicaid is our highest one. Um, it goes by days of patient days. Um, we're just below the bar, which would have been our budgeted patient days for this year um, for Medicaid. And as I mentioned before, that's actually a good thing now um, as our Medicaid rates have increased by about 30%. Um, so, and we're having higher payments from those than things like private pay. So our mindset on that has changed a little bit. Um, private pay is in the green. That's low. Um, it is a little bit higher, actually, than some of the earlier months in the year, but um, we anticipate that to stay lower. We did budget it lower for next year. Um, like I said, people just don't have the money to pay for it anymore. Um, as Also, if they live with us longer, they're using all their money to pay for it and eventually transition into Medicaid, too. So, um, But that's not necessarily a bad thing with the Medicaid rates. Um, we have Medicare on there that this month we were up to the budgeted amount, which is an awesome thing. And um, we had quite a bit of Medicare this month, both in Fireside, which is our short-term rehab, but we also had some people out in the outer buildings as well. So we are really excited about that. Um, insurance is very minimal. Um, we don't budget much for it because we don't have a ton of insurance in our area. Um, and then Veterans Affairs. Sorry. Oh, that's okay. Um, veterans Affairs, um, we have actually more than what was budgeted, and that's really hit or miss. It's just depending on if we have people admitted to us that are VA, um, which is a good payer source. It pays pretty close to Medicare rates, um, but we do have some trouble collecting from um, VA sometimes, so that sometimes can cause issues as well. I noticed that the VA is pretty steady from mm -hmm. January to now. I see don't deviate too much. Nope, it pretty much stays the same. Every once in a while, um, we'll get one or two more. Um, it is a very small number, so on this graph, it doesn't show very much its deviation. Um, typically, I would guess we have five or six people on VA in the whole campus. 
All right. So next we'll get to the reports. Um, so we have the three separate financial statements for the three separate facilities, as well as the overall um, financial statement. Um, so I'll go over the overall one, and then if there's any questions on the others, we can address those as well. Um, so there is some changes here, and that is partially due to the supplemental payment um, changing and us not getting what we anticipated to get for that. Um, so we did take that out of the projections, um, which did adjust um, to a lower number of our revenue as we were anticipating having somewhere around $300,000 from supplemental payment. Um, and that is one of the problems with us running on a different fiscal year than the state, because in theory, if we get our appeal, then we will get money from this, but it won't come until 2024. Um, so that does have some struggles with that. Um, it also does um, reflect some of the higher Medicaid rates. Um, so we did adjust to our higher Medicaid rates, but we also have submitted an appeal for a couple of things we thought were in air with our Medicaid rates as well. Um, we are able to do one appeal per, um, per quarter or when those come out. Um, so we did submit an appeal for that, um, and that's upwards to $30 a day difference based on um, the rate. So that would be $30 per day per resident. Um, so that's a big number um, that we could also get back, which was just something that they put in a different line than we thought it should be in in our cost report. Um, our cost reports is how we get our rates. Um, so that will hopefully be accepted because it was just an error in the system. So um, that will hopefully raise those rates back up. Um, in terms of other things that we typically look at, um, so that intergovernmental, that's much lower. So we have um, the projected and actuals and things like that. Um, public charges is our um, terms on there just for revenue from any of our payer sources. Um, donations is on there. That's primarily bus. Um, and then we have operations, agency staff, and depreciation on there. Any questions on the financial report from just the overall finances for this month. Um, SNF on here. Where am I looking? Expense, first expense. Oh, that's um, just, that's just for care and things. So that's like cost of operations. Mm -hmm. Oh, actually, no, that's salary and fringe. Sorry. Operate salary and yeah. fringe. Yep. I was looking at the wrong spot. Now, uh, here's a question. I don't want to take up too much time on it. Now, Chris is here too. But uh, when you look at the net uh, down there, 1.3 million or without depreciation, mm -hmm. what do you really want to look at? I mean, depreciation is something we've always talked about mm -hmm. and this and that. So in looking forward, I know you guys have been meeting and, and mm -hmm. so forth. Um, what are you really looking at here? Are you looking at this 596,000? So or... we, we have to include depreciation as an enterprise fund. Right. Um, we have to have it on there. It is not a cash expense. So that's why we include it on there without depreciation because that's the actual operating loss or income. So yeah. um, we do look at both, I would say. Um, in terms of actual operations, that would be the depreciate without depreciation would be what we look at um, because we don't set aside our depreciation in a fund to then fix things, if that makes sense. So the idea with the depreciation is that the value of things, either the building or vehicles or whatever things that get depreciated is going down as we use them. Um, and the idea is that then that money would then be used to replace them. Um, but we don't save that money in a special account or anything. So it's more of an accounting principle than actual cash. I just wanted to bring that up. But mm -hmm. uh, Supervisor Lino, did you have a question? I thought I heard something. No, just in a comfortable spot in my heart seat. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's all. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, going through the main one is enough. Okay. Maybe. All right. Um, do you want me to go through the other attachments then? You know, I, I think uh, 
it's it's been a long meeting and without okay. Jane here how about if uh, we ask uh, anybody if they have specific questions sure. on the things that have uh, that are left uh, so now the uh, agency staff uh, I know Carmen mentioned the difference between agency staff or pool staff mm -hmm. and, and our normal Dunn County staff uh, there's information on that uh, the senior meals, uh, which showed, uh, I get mixed up with all the parentheses, which sure. switch, switch, yeah. keeps changing back and forth. Senior meals is going pretty steady. Um, so we don't make a big income on that. It is basically, um, we provide the food and then the ADRC pays us for basically our expenses for it. Uh, we did actually just work with the ADRC for doing our next year's contract for that. Um, so basically just raise the rate up to them just to cover inflation. So, And uh, then, of course, the vultures. I got a question. Is the bistro open? The bistro is not open, um, primarily due to staffing. Um, we um, have had trouble staffing our kitchen, um, no different than uh, nursing staff and things like that. Um, we've had some turnover in the kitchen staff, so um, we haven't had extra hands to do that. And the fact that we've gone over the last part a little more quickly doesn't mean it's not important, yep. but I, I think uh, next meeting we'll if we have some more questions and we can look at it. Uh, so anybody have comments or questions on uh, the rest of the financials as shown to you in your packet? Okay, then uh, I think you're off the hook for any more talking I, and uh, consideration of actions to be taken by the committee. Uh, we, I would uh, take a motion to accept uh, the financial reports and the vouchers. So moved. Okay. Uh, Supervisor Witzel, Supervisor Lino. I assume there are no further comments. All in favor? Aye. No. Aye. And, and none opposed, it looks like. So uh, I think our work is done. Our next meeting time. Are there any announcements from anybody? Let's see. This is December, January. Okay. January 25th. Nine, uh, 2019. 2024. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Well, uh, thank you, Carmen, for going through the extra stuff and, and uh, the rest of you for being patient. We usually don't take this long, uh, but there were some things that it, I think it was important that, uh, Tim, uh, I, I hope that helped you a little bit. And it, it, <laughs> It was a very nice. Yes, it did. It gave, yeah. me, a, it gave me a better uh, understanding of uh, uh, being new on this committee. So thank you very, very much. Yeah, good job. Well, then uh, we are adjourned.